these many years, and, and we accept that. Now. You were there. I mean, you were there. <laughs> but you, your, your ancestors were there, were they right. not? They were. Look at the smile on your face. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And in concrete ways, what does it mean? I mean, federal money for things like well, education, actually, I, housing, etc. I, just got, back from, benefits, I right? just got back from Nashville uh, last night at 11 o'clock. We were down having meetings uh, with Mr. Franklin Keel, who was the uh, uh, area supervisor and director for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, setting up programs and how to... Now we have to negotiate budgets with these guys, mm -hmm. you know, so it's really kind of funny. Uh, Speaking of budgets, do you worry, I mean, it, this is almost a ridiculous question, but I know you know, you've read all the books and all the stuff I've read. The reality is the 1,558 members of your tribe are going to be millionaires or pretty close if you cut a deal. There have been stories about, yeah, the great news is people who haven't had great means all of a sudden get what you and others believe they're entitled to. The flip side is a ton of people are not ready for the overnight wealth and all the things that come with. Do you worry about the downside of getting what you want to get? I do. How are you preparing for that if that uh, happens? Well, one of the things that we're going to do and we're preparing for now is making sure that our uh, tribal members have uh, the ability to balance a checkbook and go through. You know, we'll be setting up uh, classes and, and informational seminars for our tribal members to be able to accept that onslaught. And it's a big responsibility. Um, you know, we have uh, tribal members probably three and four generations living in the household. Which, you know, in today's society, that's pretty sad. Mm. But at the end of the day, when we start to take over some of that stuff as a tribe and we're starting to build houses so that one generation can live and you can go to grandma and gramps' house rather than, you know, being in the same household 24-7. Uh, yeah, last night, uh, Deval Patrick was sitting in that chair and during a commercial, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, we were talking about you. He said, very decent guy, spoke well of you. Governor Patrick is on the fence, he says. The Speaker of the House is sort of not a pro casino kind of guy. You need state approval for anything to happen. You can't do what is not authorized in the state. Are you going to get approval from Beacon Hill? I think at the end of the day that, that we'll strike a deal with them that's going to be, I think, very competitive with Connecticut. I think that we're going to be able to do some unique things. I, I myself don't want to see a big proliferation of gaming and some people say, well, that's because you're selfish, you're stingy. It's not. I don't believe in it. I mean, I, I believe in it's an end to a means for, for the Commonwealth and for the tribe. And to see this become an Atlantic City or a Las Vegas, absolutely not. I wouldn't, I'd fight that. A little Nostradamus time. Is uh, Deval Patrick going to say yes to casinos in September? I think that he'll make a decision that's, that's um, based on fiscal responsibility. Has he tipped his hand to you at all in the no, discussion? No, absolutely time? not. All, that, all the governor asked me to do is uh, give him some time wait and that he was on schedule uh, and he would let us know you know midsummer to the beginning of August and from what I hear he's on schedule and um, it, it's not my job to bother him every five minutes have you made your mind up yet uh, you know where are you uh, hey Glenn Marshall congratulations on federal recognition thank and you so good much. luck in the future mr. chairman I appreciate it coming up the researcher who ran the numbers on what casinos could mean to Massachusetts stay tuned If casinos like Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun in Connecticut someday have to compete with casinos in Massachusetts, my next guest will get credit or blame, depending on your point of view. Clyde Barrow has a PhD in political science and he runs the Center for Policy Analysis at UMass Dartmouth. His research has played a major part in putting casino gaming on the table at the Massachusetts State House. Clyde, thanks so much for being here. Welcome. I think you'd agree, if the, t if the sands are tilting in the direction of Pro Casino and Beacon Hill, it's because of the need for revenues. So based on your research, what could Massachusetts realistically receive, the state government, from casinos should Glenn Marshall and others get their wish? Well, first of all, let me start by saying how much unmet demand we think is out there. Uh, there's probably about $1.1 billion available to be be recaptured from what's going to Rhode Island and Connecticut right now. From it, Massachusetts residents. From resident. Massachusetts residents alone. Uh, there's another $130 million going out of New Hampshire and Maine uh, to Connecticut. And then there's probably another $1.5 billion still out there in unmet demand that if there were casinos or slot parlors that were more proximate to residents, uh, people might go three times instead of two times a year. People who don't go now might go once or twice a year. Okay, now we have the drum roll. The drum rolls and says, da 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 da, da. 
The bottom line, potentially, annually for Massachusetts is what? About $2.5 billion. How much the state collects depends upon the tax rate and whether they structure that as a combination of casinos or a combination of casinos and slots at the four And if we track. use similar formulas to what are used in places like Rhode Island and Connecticut, what does that mean? Several hundred million dollars, three, four hundred million dollars? I'd say a minimum of five hundred million. It could possibly go as high as six or seven, depending okay, on how and they who's, structure Okay, and who are the people who are doing this? It's mostly low and moderate income people. Uh, disproportionately, is it not? Well, actually, we did some survey research to analyze that question just last November. Uh, what we found were results consistent with things that have been found elsewhere. Uh, casino uh, patrons tend primarily to be people over the age of 40. Uh, they tend to have above median household incomes, that is $45,000 or more. You'll so find it's very different from people playing the lottery, for example, Absolutely. where the studies all show it's low and moderate income people funding schools in wealthy communities. Absolutely. I think one of the mistakes people make is generalizing from lotteries to casinos, and it's a very different clientele. Okay. One of the, I won't make another mistake because I'm going to quote your own work. You put out something in February that talks about the pathological and pr the problem gaming costs tagging them potentially in Massachusetts to 170 million bucks a year. Some from individuals' pockets, a lesser amount from government. From what? Things like uh, family breakups, bankruptcy, psychological problems, all those kind of things? All of those kinds of things. Treatment, uh, families going on to social welfare as a consequence of divorces or job loss, uh, embezzlement from uh, the companies that people work for. So it's a whole variety of things. Most of those costs tend to be borne by the private sector. Estimates nationally is it probably government has to actually absorb about 20 percent of those costs. And, and there was something that has been quoted a lot, a, a congressional created national gambling impact study in the late 90s that basically says those kinds of negative impacts double in a 50 mile radius. Should there be a casino in eastern Massachusetts, whether it's Tom Menino's wish, and he's going to be sitting here with Chet Curtis in a few minutes, mm -hmm. or Glenn Marshall's wish, that's going to include most of the population of Massachusetts. So we're going to talk about an, an increased impact as opposed to when they have to travel to another state, right? Yeah, and if you look at the numbers, it's uh, about 2.7 percent of the population nationally will develop a problem with gambling at some point in their life. Actually, over half of those problems are due to lotteries, uh, a lesser proportion due to casinos. But because students, uh, from what I understand, college students disproportionately don't do so well on the casino front. We're the college student capital of America, are we not? Uh, well, I'm not exactly certain okay. about that. Uh, one of the issues, Dan Bosley, who's a big shot on Beacon Hill, obviously is no huge fan of yours. Yeah. I think that's, that's a given. He's a chair of a variety of things. He says this whole recapture notion, that we recapture these revenues, is belied by what happened in Rhode Island at Lincoln Park. That's what Rhode Island thought. They do the slots at Lincoln Park, and some URI studies suggested that just didn't happen, that a much smaller percentage was recaptured than people like you suggest. Well, first of all, that's just a, a false statement. Uh, you have to realize that the slots opened at the uh, at Newport Grand and Twin River in 1992. That was actually the same year that uh, that Foxwoods opened. So there was no recapture strategy involved in those facilities. No, but Rhode Island is. He was talking about the, the Lincoln Park kind of deal. No. Well, actually, Twin River has had a very direct and immediate impact on Foxwoods revenues, and they have admitted that in the press themselves. We only have a minute left, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. The head of the American Gaming Association, who obviously is on your side, is on. Glenn Marshall's side, was asked at a hearing recently, if they wanted to open a casino in your hometown, McLean, Virginia, where would you be? He said, I would work very, very hard to make sure it never happened. Why should anybody want a casino in their hometown? Well, obviously, there's the impact of local revenues that can accrue to a town. Middleborough is sort of working off a $7 million base. We think well, that could go as high as $21 million. Yeah. It could go as high as that. Uh, there's the job and employment impacts that are available. Average casino employs about 3,500 people. Foxwoods employs 12,000. Final thing, the former governor of Rhode Island, also not a fan of yours, said you were a paid consultant of Harris. Raise your right hand. True or not true? Absolutely false. Clyde Barrow, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Coming up, I'm